Good evening, everyone. I'm Nia Bush, and I am so happy to have y'all join us today. I am the new 2020 flood intern, and I'm so excited and thankful um, for us to be here. Um, I'd like to have y'all follow along tonight. If y'all in the notes will be in the description as well as in the chat. And I'd like to invite Christy up here with us. Christy is a writer, a blogger, and a speaker, and she's a Fl and she's a member of Flood. And she'll be talking to us tonight about healthy dating as and relationships. I'd like to pray and welcome Christy up here. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are and thank you so much for um, Christy and for her being with us tonight. I ask that you go out into um, this space and create a space for honest, rela honest relationships and honest talking and honest conversation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, if you have any questions for Christy, you can just leave them in the chat and she'll answer them at the end. Thank you. Hello. Like Nia said, my name is Christy. I'm so glad that you are joining us tonight. In case we haven't met, um, I've been a member of Flood for 10 years now. I started as a little freshman at UCSD September of 2010, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, a few things about me. I am recently married. I've been married for a whole um, month and a week, so I'm still getting used to the fact that I have a husband. And we just adopted a cat on Saturday, which we are both obsessed with, and his name is Pluto, and you can follow him on Instagram. Um, I'm what I like to call a project manager by day and a writer by passion. So I work um, at a bank from nine to five, and in my free time, I write and I speak. Um, on anything and everything, but the number one thing that I'm asked to write about and speak about is dating and relationships and singleness and everything that goes on um, in the middle of that. And so I used to write for Huffington Post. I used to write for Rel Relevant Magazine, um, a handful of other places. I have a blog where you can see the random ramblings in my mind from time to time. Um, and like I said, the main thing I'm typically asked to talk about is dating and relationships. And so I'm so excited to be here tonight talking about dating in the church and breaking up in the church because it's such a needed conversation. And I think it's something that we don't talk about enough. I think the church, the Big C Church, talks about marriage a ton. It talks about singleness a little bit, and it hardly ever talks about breakups, and it almost, or it hardly ever talks about dating, and it never talks about breakups. And so I'm so excited to be here. I'm so honored that Mindy asked me to give this workshop. I actually taught this workshop about two and a half years ago, back in the time where you could have events with people. And um, it was so much fun. I had a lot of really cool conversations afterwards with people, which I realize we can't do tonight. But what's exciting is we are gonna do a live Q&A. So like Nia said, if you have any questions um, throughout the evening, just throw them in the chat and we'll hopefully get to them at the end. Um, and yeah, this workshop, was born um, not because I'm a dating expert, not because I date perfectly, but because I think it's an important conversation that I didn't see people having. And that's the same reason I started writing about dating in my early 20s is because I didn't see people talking about it. And I was so confused because I was single and trying to date in the church and my friends were single and trying to date in the church. And I didn't see people talking about the ins and outs and how hard it was and how exciting it was. And um, the pain you sometimes feel and the excitement and just all of that, I didn't see people talking about it and I wanted people to talk about it. And so that's my hope for tonight is that I am not telling you exactly how to live your lives. I'm not telling you exactly how to date. I'm starting a conversation that I hope you continue. So these are my notes as I like to call them. These are things that I've learned that have really transformed my dating life um, that I hope can transform yours. But my hope with this is that you continue this conversation with your friends and with your roommates and you start talking about the things that you have learned about dating and you start talk talking about the things that you have learned about breakups. And we as a church start talking about these things to make it easier for the people around us. 
So a few disclaimers before I get started because I like people to know what they're getting into. Um, these are my experiences. Like I said, these are my notes um, that I've learned about dating. Um, and they're big general truths. So I'm not going to talk about specifics tonight. I'm not going to tell you the phrase to use to break up with someone. I don't have a magical way to ask someone out that they're going to say yes. These are big, broad truths um, that you can take and apply to your specifics. So I'm, I'm going to talk about overarching themes. I'm going to talk about big picture things. And dating is really personal and unique to each person. I think that sometimes the church, sometimes society in general, treats dating like it's the same for everyone. And it's not. Some things that you might love about dating, someone else might hate about dating, right? Some things that you love about singleness, other people hate. And so it's a really personal thing for each of us. And so while I'm going to talk about big truths tonight, um, some of those might not apply to you or some of those you only part of it's going to apply to you. And that's great. Like I said, I want you to talk about these things and really wrestle with what about this area that Chrissy talked about was really spot on in my life and what about that isn't part of my life, which is great. Um, another huge disclaimer, what we're talking about tonight, again, big general things about relationships. The one thing they're not going to apply to is abusive relationships. Um, I am not trained to talk about that. I'm not equipped to talk about that. Someone at Flood would love to have that conversation with you. It's just not going to be me. And so while we talk about boundaries tonight, while we talk about forgiveness and breakups and things like that, um, I don't want you to think it applies across the board. So boundaries with a healthy person are going to look very different than boundaries with an abusive person. And so I just want to make that very clear. And the other thing I want to embrace from the very beginning is there's a catch-22 um, with workshops on dating um, anywhere, but especially in the church, because if you're single and you're teaching a workshop on dating, there's someone in the audience who's thinking, well, you're single, so you don't really know that much about great relationships. But if you're married and you're teaching a workshop on dating, there's someone in the audience thinking, well, you're married, so why are you lecturing me on how to date? Um, and I get it. I have been both of those people in the audience. Uh, but the beauty of this is while I am married, I wrote this while I was single. So I think that I have hit the sweet spot. Um, you can let me know in the comments. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So a few years ago, I was sitting in therapy and my therapist asked me, have every breakup, every end of a relationship you've been through been really super intense and painful and kind of a big ordeal? And I sat there and my gut reaction was, no, of course not. And then I thought about it some more and then I was like, well, yes, um, they have, but isn't everyone's breakup painful? Isn't everyone's breakup intense and a big deal? And that question and kind of the conversations afterwards set me on this journey of exploring, is it possible to have a good breakup? Is that even a thing? Um, which at the time I didn't think so, but I started asking friends and I started looking at people around me and how they dated and how they broke up. And I started researching it. Um, if you know me, you know, I love to Google things. And so I started learning all kinds of facts about when relationships end, like, um, our brains are actually addicted to relationships. And so when we go through a breakup, our body's actually going through a detox, um, and, Scientifically speaking, three months after a breakup, studies of the brain show that pain is actually significantly reduced. So that's silly, you know, time will heal or when people just tell you, oh, it just takes time. You know, the last thing you want to hear when you're going through a breakup, it's actually scientifically proven. It takes three months to feel better. Um, and so I started learning all of these facts that I thought were so interesting, um, but didn't actually help my dating life. Um, but I also started looking at the people around me and just really seeing, is anyone doing this well? Um, and the people who are doing it well, how can I copy them? How can I live like that? And so I started realizing that if I want to break up well, I have to date well, right? I started realizing that unhealthy relationships end in unhealthy ways. And that might seem really obvious, but it just wasn't to me. And so when I finally realized, okay, if I want to break up in good ways, I have to date in good ways, which feels a little counterintuitive because you're probably thinking, if I'm dating well, I'm not going to have a breakup. I'm going to have a marriage, uh, which we're going to talk about later. But sometimes breaking up is 
the best sign of health. Sometimes breaking up is a sign of success. Sometimes breaking up is the best choice you can make. And so dating well doesn't always lead to marriage. Dating well leads to healthy relationships. And so I started realizing, okay, I want to break up well, so I want to date well. How do I start to date well? What does that look like? Again, I started looking at the people around me and the relationships that I admired and the relationships that I didn't admire. And I realized that if I want to date well, I have to take a step back and I have to focus on being a healthy person. So I realized there's this cycle of if I want to break up well, I have to date well. And if I want to date well, I have to be a healthy person. So I actually had to start with being a healthy person who then could date in healthy ways, who then could break up in healthy ways. And this cycle um, that I discovered is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and there's a handout. If you are a note taker, um, it's online. You can find it. Um, it's very easy. So if you aren't a note taker, it's just a circle. I think you can figure it out. Um, but that's really what we're going to focus on tonight. And we're going to start at the very beginning, which is how to be a healthy person. And again, this is big picture. You know, in two minutes, there's obviously a lot of ways to be a healthy person. There's um, a lot of things we can talk about. And also, it's going to look different person to person. So a healthy introvert is going to look a lot different than a healthy extrovert. A healthy 21-year-old is going to look a lot different than a healthy 37-year-old. Um, so just be aware that um, that's going to look different depending on where you're at and who you are and what your preferences are. But the first thing um, involved in how to be a healthy person is self-awareness. And so that's just what it sounds like, being self-aware. And so that's knowing who you are, um, knowing what you need, knowing your preferences, knowing what you like and what you don't like. What are your hobbies? How do you like spending your time? How do you not like spending your time? All of these are things that you need to know to know who you are, but also you need to know to be able to go into a dating relationship well. So if I know what my hobbies are, I'm not going to let the person who I'm dating dictate what I'm interested in. If I know my preferences, if I know who I am before I enter into a relationship, that stops any um, fear of someone else telling me who I am, of someone else dictating anything about me. Another huge part of self-awareness is knowing areas of growth. So your strengths and your weaknesses. What are parts of you that aren't the best that you're still working on? What are parts of you that maybe keep snagging on things? Um, we use the word triggers a lot. What are your triggers? What are things that set you off that make you go zero to 60 that don't affect other people in the same way? A part of that is family of origin. We talk about that a lot at Flood. We call it foo. Um, and so knowing, you know, how was I raised? What were the relationships that formed me that now affect how I go about my life good and bad, right? Like there are some really great things about our family of origin and there's some really hard things about our family of origin, but we have to be aware of both to be healthy people. And um, the biggest part of self-awareness as Christians is knowing our identity in Christ. And so knowing that our core worth um, comes from being a child of God. It doesn't come from our age or our gender or our job, our income bracket, um, our marital status, all of us are inherently worthy as children of God. And we each have to know that. We have to have that self-awareness that I am a child of God um, to also know who we are and how God created us. Another big um, part of how to be a healthy person is boundaries. So self-awareness is knowing what you need and boundaries is fighting for those things that you need. And so um, boundaries are limits that you put on yourself or limits that you put on other people. Um, to keep you healthy and safe and sane. So if you're an introvert, a boundary might be, I need two nights a week where I don't see anyone. Um, if you're an extrovert, a boundary might be, I need three um, coffee dates a week or FaceTime dates a week in the area of COVID because I need people in my life. So boundaries are going to look different, um, again, for each person. And a huge part of creating boundaries is self-awareness. You have to know what you need before you can ask for it. Um, you have to know who you are and kind of how you're made before you can tell people, this is how I need you to interact with me. And again, the thing I want to focus on with boundaries is we think of them a lot as walls we put up for people of like, you can only come this far, but also boundaries um, are walls we put up for ourselves. And like, how do I make sure that I stay healthy? Um, 
And sometimes they're the same wall, um, but they can be very different. And so knowing what are boundaries that I put around myself to keep me at my best versus what are boundaries that I put around other people um, to make sure that I can interact with them in the best way. And so what does this look like? How to be a healthy person in the day-to-day? Um, a big thing is counseling. Um, I am such a big fan of therapy. I think everyone should be in therapy at some point in life. Um, I realize it's expensive, um, but it's an investment in yourself that I just want to encourage everyone to try. Um, and yeah, it's just a great way to build self-awareness. It's a great way to have someone who's trained in that help you work through boundaries and help you have conversations that maybe you're still trying to figure out. Another huge aspect of how to be a healthy person is committed community. Um, and I'm not talking about the group text of people that you share funny videos with or maybe people you hang out with on Saturdays. Um, but I'm talking about it's what Henry Nowen calls soul friends. So people who um, really connect with you on a deep level um, and are committed to seeing you at your best. And so these people are the ones who will tell you if you need better boundaries. They're the ones who will help you grow self-awareness. They're the ones who are going to push you to be your healthiest, even when it's hard. That's a huge part of being a healthy person is having those people in your life and cultivating those deep relationships. And then another big one is prayer. I think that we skip over that a lot. Um, but if we really open ourselves up to the spirit, if we really ask God, I really want to know the areas I need to grow in. God will tell us. Sometimes it's painful. Um, if we really want to know what boundaries do I need to make this relationship function better, whether that's a spouse or a roommate or a coworker, um, the Spirit will show you what those boundaries are. And so a huge part of how to be a healthy person is not only being open to the Spirit, but asking for the Spirit to show up and show you those areas. So in a nutshell, that's how to be a healthy person. Again, big picture. And so if we go back to that um, cycle that we're talking about tonight, the next thing that we want to get to is how to date well. But there's this hurdle that we have to get past that I think so many people struggle with, especially in the church, and that's being okay with being single. And um, as Christians, we are called to be content with where God has us in life. That doesn't mean... You can't want something different. That doesn't mean you can't have desires for something different. If you really hate your job and want a different job, that doesn't mean you can't be job hunting and like on the lookout and not stoked on, you know, your Monday through Friday, nine to five. But we're called to a contentedness in Christ and we're called to be okay with where he has us, even if we don't understand what that looks like. So a big part of being single in the church is learning to be okay with being single and okay with all aspects of that. Again, you don't have to love every day of it, but God calls us to um, a contentedness. And um, Matt talked about this on Sunday of having a peace and having a calmness. And that should show up in our relationships, no matter what relationship status we have. And a huge part of being okay with singleness and what I've written so many articles about is realizing that singleness is not ruining your life. Singleness is not causing your loneliness. Singleness is not causing your depression. Um, singleness is not the factor that is making everything hard. It could be a contributing factor. Um, it could be one of the reasons that you are feeling lonely. It could be one of the reasons you are feeling depressed. And I'm talking about a season of depression that is normal for everyone to go through, not clinical depression, which is something very different. Um, but we need to realize that singleness is not the core issue. We need to like dig down deeper to the actual issue. So again, singleness might be contributing to your loneliness, but lonely loneliness is normally caused by a lack of connection, right? Depression, again, a season of depression is normally caused by unmet expectations. It's not caused by singleness because the problem is if we don't dig deeper into these issues and understand the underlying issues, if we live in this reality of, well, I'm lonely because I'm single or I'm unhappy because I'm single, without realizing it, we're telling ourselves, well, if I get married, I'll no longer be lonely. If I get married, I'll no longer be unhappy. If I get in a relationship, my depression will go away. So if we paint singleness as the issue, we, whether we know it or not, paint a relationship or marriage as the solution. And so we have to realize that Singleness is hard some days, just like marriage is hard some days, because life is hard some days, right? 
the church sometimes talks about how marriage is awesome and singleness is the worst or marriage is great and singleness is hard, but we have to realize that both things are both. And so until we can realize that, until we can be okay with being single, again, you can want to be married, you can want to be in a relationship, but until you have a contentedness, you're never going to be able to date well. You're never going to be able to get into a healthy relationship if on some level you think that relationship is going to fix a part of you. So that's a huge hurdle that we have to get through before we can find ourselves in a healthy relationship. So how do we date well? How do we find ourselves in healthy relationships? Um, and I just want to clarify what I mean by dating. Um, I do not mean finding your spouse. I realize that a lot of dating relationships end in marriage. I realize the path most people find themselves married is because they dated someone. But I'm talking about spending time with another human, right? Sitting down for an hour and a half over coffee or dinner or FaceTime in the era of COVID and just getting to know someone and then deciding, do I want to see this person again? Yes or no. And then going on a second date and deciding, do I want to see this person? Yes or no. That's the kind of dating I'm talking about tonight. Um, there's a book by Dr. Henry Cloud that's listed in the resources that does a better job of unpacking that, that I'm not going to try to attempt to do. Um, but obviously I want to embrace that most people in the church date with the intention of marriage. I'm not ignoring that, but when I talk about dating tonight, I'm talking about the act of dating, the getting to know someone, the deciding, do I want to see them again? Not the, I've dated this person for seven months and now we're talking about engagement. That's a different kind of dating and a different kind of um, conversation. And so when we're dating, as in asking people on dates and going on a first date and going on a second date and maybe like casually dating after a month, how do we do that well? Especially in small Christian circles in the church, especially when everyone knows each other and people have kind of dated each other, things like that. The biggest thing I can tell you is honest communication. <clears throat> That's I mean, number one for any kind of relationship, whether it's a roommate or a coworker or your parents, honestly communicate where you're at, what you want. Um, just be honest. And the thing is, that's hard. It's really scary to be honest with people. It's really scary to say, this is what I want, whether that's I want to go on a date with you, whether that's I want you to ask me out, whether that's I want you to do the dishes. Sometimes it's really hard to um, be able to communicate what's going on in our head and trust people with that information. But the thing is, relationships are hard and relationships are scary and relationships are vulnerable. And so we have to be willing to do scary and vulnerable things if we want to have good relationships that are worth it. The other um, big thing about how to date well is respect for others. And so this is, you know, respect for others' um, time, respect for their emotions. And so if you're going to ask someone on a date, respect them enough to actually say, I want to take you on a date. Don't ask them to hang out. Don't ask them, um, you know, in a weird group hang that they don't really know what's going on. Um, actually ask them for what you want because you want to respect their emotions because you don't want to confuse them. You don't want to confuse yourself. You don't want to get your, into like a weird situation where no one knows what's going on. That's just not a loving thing to do. And that goes back to honest communication of if you're respecting other people's time, you're going to honestly communicate after two dates, hey, I don't see this going anywhere. Um, versus if you're not respecting their time, you might go on dates for three months, which I've seen people do. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I knew that wasn't going to go anywhere after two days. It's like, why don't you respect people's time? Why don't, as a church, we um, acknowledge that people are worth our honesty and people are worth um, knowing where we're at? And so how to date well also builds on top of how to be a healthy person. So we need that self-awareness that we learned as healthy people to date well. And so self-awareness in dating looks like knowing how you date, knowing what you want, knowing what you look for. We need that self-awareness to um, go into dating with that knowledge. Because if you just show up and you have no idea what you want in a date, you have no idea what you're looking for, you have no idea who you are, you're not going to be a very good date, um, but also you can't enter into a healthy relationship because you're not giving that person anything to work with. Um, also, a huge part of self-awareness in dating is knowing issues that you've run into in the past. Maybe why did your last relationship end? Maybe, um, again, triggers um, that you might be aware of in your personal life. 
go into your dating life. So what are things that people do to you that really affect you? And how can you be aware of that as you're dating people? In a similar way, how do you react to things? How do you fight? How do you um, love people? How do you accept love? Um, a lot of people talk about like the five love languages. If you know that about yourself, you're able to enter into a relationship in a healthier way because you know how you feel most loved. In the same way, like how do you fight? Do you not fight well? Are you really bad at bringing up conflict? You don't have to be perfect to enter into a healthy relationship, but being aware of your weaknesses allow you to enter in, in a healthy way. And again, a huge part of how to date well, similar to how to be a healthy person, is boundaries. And we talk a lot about physical boundaries in the church, at least if you grew up in youth group like I did. Um, I'm not here to tell you how far is too far. We're not talking about physical boundaries tonight. But a big thing that I don't think we talk about enough is emotional boundaries. I never heard of emotional boundaries until I was in college. And so in a similar way, you need emotional boundaries in a relationship, just like you have physical ones. And so emotional boundaries look like if you, you know, are staying up till 3 a.m. texting someone all the deep, dark secrets about your life when you've known them for two weeks. That's probably an emotional boundary you don't want to cross. And I think the danger in Christian dating is that we overemphasize physical boundaries and um, we won't make out with someone after knowing them for two weeks, but we will share our personal testimony after two weeks or we'll develop this emotional bond because we can't do the physical stuff that we might want to do. And I think it's just as dangerous. Um, I heard it mentioned once that there are three layers, if you will. There's um, emotional intimacy, there's physical intimacy, and there's spiritual intimacy. And as your relationship develops, um, so maybe like on date one, you're here. And on date 17, you're here. And when you get engaged, you're up here. And they should all be going up kind of around the same um, time. Versus if your physical intimacy skyrockets, but your emotional and spiritual intimacy is down here, your relationship's going to feel off balance. In the same way, if your physical intimacy is down here, but your emotional intimacy is way up here, you're going to feel off balance. And so developing boundaries, um, emotional, physical, is so important in healthy dating. And a huge part of that is self-awareness to know what you need. Um, so for example, a big physical boundary for me was um, when I was dating, I wouldn't kiss a boy until he was my boyfriend. That's just something I learned that was good for me. And in a similar way, an emotional boundary that I had when I was dating was I wouldn't have certain conversations about my past with a boy until he was my boyfriend because I just felt like I needed that commitment before we could raise those lovers up. And so that's going to be different for every person and every relationship. Boundaries look different with different people, they look different in different seasons, um, but that self-awareness and kind of that bedrock of being a healthy person, you can draw on when you're figuring out what your boundaries look like in a dating relationship. So what does dating well look like in the day-to-day? -day? Um, it means actually dating people, which again, seems obvious, but the church can just be so terrified of dates sometimes. I think that we overemphasize marriage and we think to ask someone out, you have to know if you're going to marry them. You have to know if you're compatible. You have to know all of these things about them um, when you should just ask them to coffee and get to know them, right? You should just sit in front of another human and talk to them for an hour or two and then go on with your life. And so um, I realized that dating can be stressful and I'm not trying to oversimplify things, but I think that we just need to take the pressure off, especially in the church. And if we do, if we realize a coffee date is just a coffee date, it's not an engagement, um, it's just easier. I'm not worried that I just accepted a proposal if I'm going to coffee with someone. In the same way, if I ask someone to coffee and they say no, I'm not crushed thinking I just lost my future spouse. It's just coffee. And so we need to just date people and ask people on dates and use the word date and stop being scared of it. I realize in COVID that might look a little different, but actually date each other. That's the best way to date in healthy ways is to actually date. Also have fun with it. I know that, like I said, dating can be stressful. It can't have, it can have a lot of anxiety involved, um, but it should be fun, right? It should be exciting. Crushes are fun. First dates are fun. You should be having a good time with it. And if you aren't having fun dating, it might be a good time to take a step back and examine why whether that's with a therapist, whether that's with a close friend, um, but really try to get to those underlying issues like we talked about before of why am I not enjoying this and why am I so stressed out and why am I not having fun with something that should be enjoyable? 
and this I think goes without saying, but I'm just going to say it, um, a key part of dating in a healthy way involves dating a healthy person, right? So you can do all of the work you want and enter into something in a healthy way, but if you are dating an unhealthy person, it's never going to be a healthy relationship. Two healthy people make a healthy relationship. One healthy person and one unhealthy person make an unhealthy relationship every time, no questions asked. So a huge part of trying to date in healthy ways involves vetting the people you're dating and getting to know them, again, on a coffee date or over dinner or over FaceTime and deciding, do you seem like a healthy person? Are you in a healthy spot? Do you have self-awareness? Do you have good boundaries? Um, Are you able to openly communicate with me or not? And from there, deciding, does this person seem healthy and like a relationship that's worth pursuing? Okay, so we talked about how to date well, and now we're going to get to how to break up, which I know is what everyone wants to talk about. But again, there's a hurdle involved here, right? A hurdle that we have to get over. And that is being okay with breaking up. I've said this before. um, I think the church can sometimes overemphasize marriage. I think that it can make marriage the ideal. Um, And so it makes relationships that end in marriage successful. And therefore, it makes um, relationships that end in breakups seem like failures, um, which is really unfair. And when you're dating, it's really crushing to not only be going through a breakup, but feeling like you failed. And I've definitely been there. And so, um, like I said, we need to take the pressure off, um, but we also need to realize that breaking up can be such a sign of health. Sometimes it can be the healthiest thing that you can do. Um, sometimes it can be the, a sign of success if two people um, are able to sit down and decide, you know what, this just isn't it. Let's walk away before this, like, we go further and um, spend more of our time getting to know each other when we know we're, this isn't just going to work out. That's a huge sign of two healthy people. And I think in a weird way, we should kind of celebrate those breakups. Um, but the problem is with the church is when we zero in on marriage, we um, think that we just take breakups off the table, right? And so this hurdle, being okay with breaking up, we almost have to leave the idea of breaking up on the table while we're dating. So while we're evaluating, while we're getting to know someone, we're not zeroed in on you're cute, I like you, we both want the same amount of kids, so like we are getting married. Uh, We keep the option of breaking up on the table of you're cute and I like this about you and I like that about you. But the whole time there's this option of like this might not work out. You know, we might get three months down the road, two years down the road, and just find out this isn't good for us, whether it's something in my life change, something in your life change, we just learn something. And if we have this on the table the entire time we are dating, the entire time we are evaluating things, it's so much easier to grab that option off the table and to both grab it and say, this is where we're at, versus if you've shoved that off the table and again, are zeroed in on marriage, it's impossible to have a healthy breakup because you never thought a breakup was even an option. And so um, I'm really into yoga and I was um, in yoga a few years ago um, and we were doing all these crazy balancing poses and I'm pretty clumsy and so I was having a hard time and our teacher had us all take a breath, kind of reset, and then she said this thing they'll never forget. She said, remove yourself from committing to the end result and allow yourself the freedom to simply experience it. And she was talking about like standing on one leg, right? But it applies to so many areas of life, especially dating. And if we commit to the end result way too early in, we don't actually get to experience dating. We don't get to experience the fun and the excitement and the stress and all of that because we're already in our minds married or engaged. Um, And so I just wanna challenge you guys with, Being okay with breaking up doesn't make breaking up less painful. I won't tell you things that aren't true. Um, But it allows you the freedom to experience dating. And I think it allows you the freedom to experience dating in a healthy way because you're actually evaluating, is this person good for me? Am I good for this person Um, at all times? Versus we've been on three dates and I think I want to marry them. So now I have to marry them no matter what. And that's a really painful place to be if you ever get to the point where it's like, I'm not going to marry them. And how do I now sit with this additional grief that maybe I didn't have to put myself through? Um, A pastor um, that has a really great series on dating, which I link to in the resources, talks about it of when you're dating someone, the only thing you owe them is your honesty. 
Um, obviously, when you're engaged or if you're in like a committed relationship with them, you might owe them other things that you've agreed to. But in the early stages of dating, all you owe people is your honesty, nothing more. Whether that's, I want to see you again. I don't want to see you again. Um, you know, I think I'm in a healthy place. I don't think I'm in a healthy place. Whatever the honesty is. And so in the same way, I think that what we owe each other is to keep the option of breaking up on the table just to allow ourselves to date each other in a healthy way. And so now we're going to get to what we've all been waiting for. How do we break up well? How does anyone do this? What is the magical answer? Um, I wish I had a magical answer for you, but um, we'll, we'll see how good it is. Um, obviously, this is going to depend on the relationship, right? Were you guys dating for a month? Were you dating for a year? Um, have you guys met each other's families? Um, were you casually dating? Were you thinking you were going to marry the person? So this is going to be dependent on the length of the relationship, the seriousness of the relationship. Also, it's going to depend on you. Um, but how to break up well is going to build upon the other things we've talked about, right? So if we go back to that honest communication of how to date well, honest communication is so important in breaking up well, right? So it's letting people know where you're at. It's letting people know what you're thinking. Um, it's not being evasive. It's not trying to shy away from hard conversations because you might hurt their feelings. Um, if you shy away from being honest with someone in a committed relationship, you're going to hurt their feelings more. Um, and the biggest part of how to break up well with honest communication is communicating even when it's hard. It's really hard to break up with someone. It's really hard to tell someone, I don't think I can date you right now for these reasons, or I don't think I'm in a place to commit to this. Like that's a really hard thing to say. Um, but we have to be honest about that and we have to show up. Um, and we don't, um, we shouldn't lie about it. We shouldn't give reasons that aren't true. We shouldn't try to pass it off on, well, it's not you, it's me. Or, oh, well, I just feel like God told me to break up with you. Um, we should be really honest. You know, is it really not you? It's actually what I'm going through? Then you can say that. But if you're going to say it, you have to mean it. And um, we just have to be honest about these things because breakups aren't easy. They're never going to be easy. But they're a lot easier when you're being honest. And then respect for others. So respect them, again, enough to be honest with them, even when it's hard, even when it's something kind of painful to say. Um, respect them enough to communicate lovingly. Even if you're going through a breakup where you feel wronged, um, you feel like, you know, you have every right to yell at them and or be a jerk to them, respect them enough that, like, that's just not what's needed right now. Um, and post-breakup, Respect people um, enough to be the bigger person. I think in the church, it's so hard to um, date in small Christian circles, whether you're in the same friend group or same life group or whatever that looks like, and then you break up with them, and then you're still in these small groups, and you see each other every Thursday or at so-and-so's birthday party or what have you. And so um, respect for others really comes to play with, like, respect them to be a bigger person. Um, so whether you're hurting, whether you feel wronged, whether you think like I should win the friend, the friends group, or this is my life group first, like I'm going to stay here and you have to get kicked out. Um, respect them enough to either have a conversation about that. If you think it's something you have to have a conversation about, um, I'll say I dated a lot at flood. I had a lot of awkward interactions at flood, whether at life groups or, um, when I was an intern at flood and it's really complicated and it gets really messy really fast. And I think... The thing that I've learned um, the most is that if you are going through a breakup, um, even if you feel wronged, even if you feel like you deserve um, everyone to know that you were in the right or you broke up with them or what have you, um, just gather your closest friends around you. And those people um, are going to be the ones that know all the intimate details of your relationship. They're going to be the ones that know who broke up with who and all the horrible things they did. Um, and those are the people that you're going to vent to. And those are the people that are going to really rally around you and let your ex have their group of people. And those people, again, are going to know the intimate details and they're going to know everything and what have you. But leave your bigger community out of it. You don't need to involve your life group in the drama of your breakup. You don't need to involve, you know, your whole friends group. You don't need to have someone canceling their birthday party, what have you, over this breakup. Um, I'm not saying you can't talk about it. I'm not saying, like, don't be honest with people and invite people into that if it's necessary. But um, I think especially in this age of social media and reality TV, and it's really easy to think that 
um, I want everyone to know that I was in the right, or I want everyone to know this. And I think as Christians, that's just not helpful. And so especially if we want sustainable communities moving forward where people are dating each other, um, we need to just do the healthy option, which is let me have my people and let me um, grieve this, which we're going to talk about, um, and let me rally those people. And I don't need all of these people involved in this right now. And so, again, building off of how to be a healthy person, self-awareness is really big in breakups and how to break up well. And so that's knowing what you need. And that's um, knowing when a relationship gets to a certain point that, like, this isn't a good place for me anymore or this person isn't who I thought they were anymore or um, now that I found out these things, that's just not what I'm looking for. And so now it's my time to bow out or kind of end things. And so self-awareness, knowing what you're looking for, in relationships, knowing, again, what you need as a person is so big and being able to have conversations about breaking up and knowing when to break up, when to not break up, things like that. Um, and post-breakup, self-awareness is so key and just knowing what you need as a person. Um, I'm a huge introvert. I need a lot of time to process things. And so I had to learn when I go through a breakup, I have to ask for a lot of space from the person I just broke up with, but even sometimes from my friends. Like I need to go journal in my room. I need to be alone for a lot of time because I really have to process my thoughts myself. Um, but also I have to, I had to learn that there's a certain point I get where I have to invite my friends in and I need my people. And so you need that self-awareness when you're going through breakups to know what to ask for because people can't read your mind and people aren't going to know, do you want space or do you want people? Um, the person you just broke up with isn't going to know, can I text you or can I not text you unless you express that. And so you really have to like figure out what do I need? Do I want to tell this person don't text me ever again or am I going to see them once a week on Sundays? And so a text every now and then will make that feel more normal. That's purely for you to decide and you get to ask for that. And so part of self-awareness and part of honest communication is knowing what you need and then asking for what you need. And um, one thing I will say about self-awareness is you have to value your health above everything else because no one else will, right? And so I think a lot of times people, especially in the church, go through a breakup and they need space and they need to heal, um, but they don't want to seem mean and they don't want to seem rude and they don't want to ask their ex, please leave my life group or please don't talk to me on Sundays or whatever it is because they're like, well, I'm a Christian. I should be nice and happy and what have you. Um, but if you don't prioritize what you need, no one else is going to. And so a huge part of self-awareness is knowing what you need and then knowing that you have to fight for it, right? And that goes into boundaries. Again, building off what we talked about. Um, boundaries and breakups is having those lines. If a relationship gets to this point, it needs to end. If, a, if someone treats me in this certain way, that's not what I want. And so I'm going to tell them I'm no longer dating you. But in a post-breakup, again, what does space look like? What are the boundaries you need to be healthy? Is it you guys need to be in different life groups? Is it we can't talk anymore? We can't text. We have to unfollow each other on Instagram. Like whatever it is, um, it's not silly. It, whatever you need to be healthy, you have to ask for that. And you have to put those boundaries in place. And people can't read your mind. Um, so you have to express those boundaries. And you have to know to ask for them. And you also have to work on them. So if you tell someone, hey, don't text me but then you're texting them, you're not following those boundaries. So boundaries go both ways. And I think what's really hard when you um, break up in the church in small Christian circles is figuring out those boundaries. Because it is really difficult when you break up with someone that you see every Wednesday night, or you break up with someone who you used to sit with in the same row at church. And I realized, again, COVID makes that a little different, um, but it's still hard when you break up with someone and you see them on Instagram or you're in the same group text, or whatever it is. And so I don't have a perfect answer for you. Again, that's going to look like a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, I'm a pretty private person, so I typically had really strong boundaries with people I broke up with. Please don't call me. Please don't text me. Um, I don't follow people on social media that I've dated in the past just because for me, I don't need to see intimate parts of their lives on my like newsfeed. Um, and those are my boundaries. And so it might be totally different for you, but the thing is, is figuring those out with that self-awareness and honestly communicating them and then fighting for them, right? And like holding to them and realizing this is how I stay healthy. Like this is how I'd be a healthy person. And so that's how I'm going to be a healthy 
that's how I'm going to go through a healthy breakup is to revert back to what makes me a healthy person. And that's these boundaries. And then um, two big things about how to break up well. Um, The first is healthy grieving. So we have to actually mourn the loss that it is. Christians can tend to um, want to avoid grief at all costs. We like to be happy and joyful and focus on all the good things God does. Um, But a breakup is a loss. Whether it was a month relationship or a year relationship, you had something and now you don't have it. And so you need to grieve that and you need to mourn that. Um, And sometimes you have to welcome people into that process with you. Again, it takes a lot of self-awareness to know how you grieve and what kind of grief you need. Um, But grief is important in the breakup process. Grief is a process, and you have to allow yourself the time to go through that process. And then the last one that I have listed is seeking God's goodness. And this kind of comes with a backstory as we wrap up tonight. Um, I, a couple years ago... Um, had an ex at Flood who started dating a friend of mine at Flood, and I was navigating a friend's group who all of a sudden didn't really feel safe, and we all went to the same service on Sunday, so all of a sudden church didn't feel safe, and I was trying my best to navigate this in a healthy way and welcome people in and figure out what my boundaries were and figure out, um, you know, have the self-awareness and the respect for them and everything that I've talked about tonight, but it was still hard, right? Breakups are still hard even when you're doing the best you can. Um, And so one night I was at church, I was sitting alone, and this couple came in late and just happened to sit a couple rows in front of me, directly in my line of sight of the stage. And so I was trying my best to focus on church and not these people. And at the end of um, the night in worship, they sang that song, um, the Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And they have that line in the song that says, We want to experience the glory of your goodness. And I was just struck that night by we don't get to decide what God's goodness looks like in our life. We want it to be good. It's not always good. We want it to be exactly what we want. It's usually not. Sometimes his goodness is painful. And I just felt like God told me that night, you don't get to decide what my goodness looks like in your life. And you don't get to decide what my goodness looks like in their life. And so if my goodness right now is glorified in this new relationship, you should want that. Because if you want my goodness in your life, you want my goodness in your community's life, and you're going to want my goodness in their lives. doesn't mean you have to be stoked on this relationship. It doesn't mean you have to hang out with them. But at the end of the day, you should want my goodness in the people's lives around you. And so that mentality seeking out God's goodness for the people I'm dating, the people I'm breaking up with, the people who I broke up with and around dating other people, um, really just transformed how I went about dating. Because I realized if I want God's goodness for me and I want God's goodness for you, I'm going to honestly communicate what I need. I'm going to have really good boundaries. I'm going to work on myself to be the healthiest person that I can be so I can enter into this relationship to be the healthiest relationship possible out of respect for you because I want God's goodness to abound here. And so I really had to learn what that looks like in my life and in dating and things like that. And it just really changed how I approached dating because I was not seeking out a relationship for the sake of a relationship. I wasn't seeking out what I wanted in a situation. I was taking a step back and realizing I want God's goodness here. And what does that look like? Does it look like dating this person? Does it look like breaking up with this person? Does it look like engaging in this conversation? Or does it look like taking a step back? And so the number one way that um, you can be able to want goodness for the person that you are dating and breaking up with or breaking up with you is to be a healthy person who is dating in a healthy way who can then break up in a healthy way, right? And that's really, as followers of Christ, what we should all be working on. How do we seek out God's goodness? How do we, as Flood says, how do we be a movement of hope and healing? How do we enter into everything we're doing with the mindset of God's goodness above everything else? And so I think if we do that, we are going to be healthy people. And if we have God's goodness at the forefront of our mind, we're going to date well because we have a bigger picture to work with. And if we are healthy people who are dating well, we're going to be able to break up well. So that is what I have for tonight. I know that we have um, some questions and answers, or some questions, and I will provide the answers. Um, And so Mindy, I don't know if you just want to start. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, one question that came in was, what are some tips or suggestions to combat loneliness? So if someone's experiencing loneliness, uh, how, can you can you share any, any tips or suggestions? Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. Um, it goes into a lot, obviously, self-awareness. If you're an introvert versus an extrovert, um, if you live with five people, if you live by yourself, loneliness is going to look a lot different. Um, I would say for me, and again, I'm a major introvert, um, and I um, typically live with two other people, so in a house of three people, um, before I got married, so have that context in mind. Um, but it's really focusing on building a community of people around you. Um, and I know that's easier said than done, but if you date your friends and I realize you're like, well, I want to be dating other people, not my friends. But if you really invest in people around you, if you invest in, like I said, soul friends, if you, uh, really work on creating, um, a community around you, that's going to carry you through whatever season, I, I won't say you'll never feel lonely, but for me, that's how I, I don't want to say filled the need, but. Loneliness is a lack of connection. And so if you have deep, meaningful connection with other people, whether it's romantic or not, you're going to feel less lonely. And so I, um, when I was single, my two best friends were married and I would hang out with them and their spouses all the time. And I loved it because I was really good friends with their spouses. And it was a give and take relationship. And I had deep, meaningful relationships and conversations and they looked out for me and I looked out for them and I wasn't dating anyone but I didn't feel the lack of connection and the lack of love and the lack of um taken care of that I think a lot of people associate singleness with because I had those connections just in other contexts that's awesome thank you um another one that came in is at what point would you say a couple should take a breakup off the table would it be engagement yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say probably at engagement. Um, I mean, I do think maybe not. Maybe I would say marriage. Um, I I don't want anyone to have to break, break off an engagement. That sounds like a very painful thing. But I know some people who have had to do that. And again, I think that they made a healthy decision. And so um, I would say the definite point where you pull the break off off the table is on your wedding day when you are actually committing, you know, before God and vowing, like, you are it for the rest of my life. Um, I would think at engagement, you know, at a proposal, you are promising that um, to a degree, but it's not finalized in a weird way. And so I would say that um, in a dating mindset, once you're engaged, you kind of kick that off the table. But um, I do know some people who've had to pull that back on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Another one that just came in is, in general, is it acceptable to break up and get back together? Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, I would say, in general, that's hard just because it's going to depend on so many things. Um, but I would say if – you are a healthy person and they are a healthy person. You guys can decide if getting back together is a healthy idea. Um, I've seen some people break up and get back together and it was great and awesome and they did it in a healthy way and it worked out for them. I've seen other people break up and they both were in very unhealthy places and they got back together um, and it didn't work out. And so I think that's more of a question of – self-awareness and boundaries and why are you getting back together um, and I think that's a great thing to bring your community into um, and ask the people closest to you and ask um, you know people who saw you together of what did you think of us together we're thinking about getting back together you know do you have any insight was I the best version of myself around this person what did you think about that um, and really trust those people's insight into that um, yeah I love that um if someone breaks up with you, what are some tips for not receiving that as personal rejection? Hmm. Yeah, that's really hard. Um, again, it goes into it goes into a lot of self awareness. It goes into a lot of knowing your identity, knowing your worth, um, which is so hard to do when you get broken up with, right? It's so hard to not feel like 
um, I did something wrong or something's wrong with me or if only I was like this, this person would still be dating me. Um, but I think that at least for me, um, I had to do a lot of work on knowing my identity in Christ. I had to do a lot of work in knowing my strengths. I also had to do a lot of work in knowing what I wanted. And so um, if someone broke up with me, I was able to be like, okay, obviously that means we're not compatible or something's off here. And I want a relationship where I am compatible with someone. I want a relationship that we do have a future together. And so it doesn't mean it's not going to hurt, but I was able to not think, oh my gosh, I did something that caused this or something's wrong with me. And that's why they broke up with me. It was more of like, this is a clear sign. This wasn't my person. And so I'm able to move on in a little easier way than blaming myself for that breakup. No. Hey, Christy, do you have any um, thoughts or tips for the world of online dating? <laughs> yes, online dating. Um, I actually met my husband online. So I'm very pro online dating. Um, I think the number one thing about online dating is you actually have to date. You shouldn't just message people if you're just swiping all day long. Um, you're not really doing it. You're just swiping. Um, and one of the um, books in my resources, which I'll get to in a second, is called Modern Romance. And it's so fascinating. And it's all about modern dating. And most of it's about online dating because that is modern dating. Um, but in this book, the author talks about how people who online date just to swipe obviously doesn't go anywhere because you're just like swiping through profiles. And then people who swipe and then match with people and just message them all day long Nothing happens because you're just texting people and texting people isn't dating people. Um, but if you actually are using online dating to date someone, it's great. You can decide if you want to date in person. You can decide if you want to go on a second date. Um, COVID obviously makes that a little more complicated. I know some people have been doing FaceTime dates during COVID. Um, but that's my number one thing about online dating is actually use it to date. Don't use it to text people. Um, use it to actually date people. And I will say there's a weird stigma, I think, uh, in the church about online dating because the, people think that it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, too superficial. Like, oh, I just saw someone's picture and I'm going to judge off of that. Like, that feels really shallow and we're Christians and so we don't do that. And I would always tell people, if you would be at a coffee shop or a bar and you saw someone cute and go over and talk to them, that's the same thing that online dating is. You saw someone cute and you decided to say yes or no to going to talk to them. And so there's nothing wrong with online dating as a Christian, um, as long as you're doing it with, you know, all of your values and morals in place. Um, and again, as long as you're being a healthy person, you can enter into a great relationship online dating that you could through a setup or through a coffee shop or through someone at work. That's good. That's really good. Thank you. Um, another thought, and this was emailed to me a while ago, was, um, in this very unique season that we're in right now, going through a pandemic, uh, you know, dating is kind of looking a little bit different right now. Do you have any thoughts or tips um, for people who might want to date? And it's a really strange year in 2020 to uh, even think about that, let alone yeah. take any steps toward anything. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm hesitant to speak into this because I've never dated in COVID. Um, but I will say, um, obviously, you need to decide where you're at with COVID. I know some people who are totally fine hanging out with people outside as long as, you know, it's outdoors and you can go on a hike. Then it's like, if you're okay with that, then you're okay with going on a hike for a date or going on a picnic or whatever that looks like. So that it's going to involve a lot of self-awareness just from a purely safety level of what am I okay with dating wise just like what am I okay with seeing friends wise what's that gonna look like that's gonna be different for everyone um but I think that you can totally start a relationship off over FaceTime over email um you know whatever technology we have these days I know it's not ideal um I know obviously you'd want to have it in person um but I know a lot of people who started long distance relationships through FaceTime and through email and through text and um they made it work. And so I don't think dating during COVID is off the table. It's obviously more complicated. I won't pretend it's not. But I think that if you either are interested in pursuing dating or you find someone that you're like, man, if it wasn't a pandemic, I'd totally date them. I think it's still an option. You're going to have to get creative. 
Um, it's going to take a lot of honest communication, right? You can't just hang out with someone during a pandemic. You actually have to be like, can we FaceTime? Um, but again, I think that any healthy relationship is going to involve vulnerability and um, asking for things and knowing what you want to ask for it. Um, so it's going to take creativity, but I would say it's possible. Hey, I think that's, I think we're, we're ready to, to hear the Wrap up. Yeah, resources and Perfect. anything else you can share. Yeah. So, um, I mean, like it's been said before, there's a handout um, either on the website or I think it's been linked to in the comments. And at the very bottom is some resources that I put together. Um, some are books, some are podcasts. Um, so you kind of get a little mix in there of whatever you like. Some are Christian, faith-based, some are not. Um, so again, just know it's kind of a mix of everything. Um, I kind of like that. I like learning from different sources. Um, the two that I talked about um, during this talk is Modern Romance by Aziz Ansari. It's great for online dating. It's great for just dating in the modern era. Um, and then um, Dr. Henry Cloud's um, I'm going to figure out what it's called. It's called How to Get a Date Worth Keeping. Excuse me, which sounds like the worst self-help book ever, but it's one of the best books I have ever read um, on relationships. I have given it to almost everyone I know. Um, and so don't let the title fool you. Depending what copy you order, the um, cover is also just like so cheesy, um, but it's so helpful. And so um, I would definitely recommend it. It's a short read. It's really practical. Um, so those are the two that I mentioned, but there's also, again, some other things. Some are about dating, some are about just being a healthy person, growing self-awareness, things like that. I also listed my website on there um, if you want to follow my blog, but also on my website, you can contact me. You can follow me on social media. Um, again, when I taught this two and a half years ago, I was able to talk to people afterwards, which I loved. So if you want to shoot me an email, um, I don't have natural answers, but I would love to um, chat with you. And then I also have Mindy's contact. And so um, you can reach out to her. You can reach out to Flood for more resources, more questions. Um, yeah, Mindy was the one who years ago connected me with my first therapist. And so I love Flood's heart for therapy and for helping people grow and for um, just, yeah, connecting people with the resources they need. And so I know she would love to help you with that if that's something you're interested in. Um, and those are, that's everything I have tonight. So I hope that this was helpful for you. I hope that it was hopeful for you. Um, I know that dating and relationships and breakups and singleness can be really hard. Um, but I hope that what I talked about tonight gave you something to think about. And so my big challenge as we leave tonight or as you end this bro uh, broadcast is really think about that cycle and think about where you're at in it, right? Are you stuck on one of those hurdles? Are you stuck in an area that you wish you were going around the circle and you just can't get there? Um, and really reflect on why and try to dig into that, whether that's with a counselor, with a trusted friend, um, whether that's with your community group. Um, start kind of unpacking where you're at and where you want to be at and how you can get there. So thanks for joining.